Imagine building the first gasoline-powered car in your entire country, having Henry Ford himself offer to go into business with you, and saying no because you thought automobiles had no commercial future. This is exactly what happened to George Foote Foss, a bicycle mechanic from Sherbrooke, Quebec, who in 1896 created something that should have made him one of the automotive industry's founding fathers. Instead, his story became one of the most fascinating what-ifs in Canadian engineering history. Picture this. It's 1896 in Sherbrooke, Quebec. The streets are filled with horses, carriages, and the occasional bicycle. George Foote Foss, a 23-year-old bicycle mechanic, is working in his cramped repair shop on Wellington Street when he gets his hands on a copy of Scientific American. Inside is a detailed article about gasoline engines, these new internal combustion contraptions that are causing a stir in Europe and the United States. While most people saw it as an interesting curiosity, Foss saw potential. Not for transportation, mind you. He thought it might make a decent stationary power source for machine shops. But first, he'd have to build one. George Foote Foss wasn't trying to revolutionize transportation. He wasn't even trying to build a car. He was simply a skilled mechanic with an insatiable curiosity about this new technology called the internal combustion engine. What he ended up creating would become the first gasoline-powered automobile ever built in Canada, beating every other Canadian inventor by at least two years. And when Henry Ford came knocking with a partnership offer in 1902, Foss's response would baffle historians for the next century. To understand why a bicycle mechanic in Quebec was building engines in 1896, we need to understand the era. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Steam engines powered factories and locomotives, but they were massive, dangerous, and required constant attention. Electric motors existed but needed expensive infrastructure. The gasoline engine promised something different, portable power that didn't need rails or wires. In the United States, the Duryea brothers had just started selling their motor wagons in 1893. In Germany, Carl Benz was refining his patent motor wagon. But in Canada? Nothing. The Dominion was still firmly in the age of horses. Foss's bicycle shop was doing well enough, but like many mechanics of his generation, he was fascinated by the cutting edge of technology. Bicycles were the high-tech transportation of the 1890s, precision machines that required skilled maintenance. The leap from maintaining bicycles to building engines wasn't as far as you might think. Both required understanding of precision machining, gear ratios, and mechanical efficiency. Foss had all these skills. What he didn't have was any blueprint for building an internal combustion engine. The challenge Foss faced was monumental. In 1896, you couldn't order engine parts from a catalog. Every single component had to be either hand-fabricated or adapted from existing machinery. Foss had to become simultaneously an engineer, a metallurgist, a chemist, and an inventor. He needed to understand thermodynamics without formal training, create precision parts without modern tools, and solve problems that even trained engineers in major cities were struggling with. And he had to do it all in a bicycle shop in Quebec, with no one to help him and no one to ask for advice. Starting in early 1896, Foss began his engine project, working entirely from the Scientific American article and his own mechanical intuition, he started crafting components. The engine block was cast at a local foundry from his own patterns. The pistons were turned on a lathe he'd modified himself. The carburetor, that crucial component that mixes air and fuel in just the right proportions, he invented from scratch, having never seen one in person. The engine was a single cylinder, four-stroke design. The bore was four inches, the stroke six inches giving a displacement of about 75 cubic inches, or 1.2 liters. By modern standards, that's a large displacement for a single cylinder, but Foss was following the design philosophy of the era, long stroke, low RPM, maximum torque. The compression ratio was probably around 4-1, typical for the period when fuel quality was unpredictable and detonation 
was poorly understood. The ignition system was particularly clever. Foss used a make-and-break system where electrical contacts inside the combustion chamber would separate at the moment of ignition, creating a spark. This was more reliable than the early spark plugs, but required precise timing. Foss created his own timing mechanism using a cam and lever system adapted from sewing machine parts. The cooling system was primitive, but effective. A water jacket around the cylinder with natural convection circulation. No pump, no fan, just physics. But here's where it gets interesting. After successfully testing his stationary engine, Foss decided to mount it on a carriage, not because he believed in the future of automobiles, but because he wanted to demonstrate the engine's portability at the upcoming Sherbrooke Fair. He bought a used Concorde buggy for $15, reinforced the frame with angle iron, and began the conversion. The drivetrain was ingenious in its simplicity. Power from the engine went through a leather belt to a jack shaft mounted under the carriage body. From there, sprockets and chains, technology borrowed directly from bicycles, drove the rear wheels. Foss incorporated a differential gear, something many early car builders overlooked, allowing the wheels to rotate at different speeds when turning. The whole system could be engaged or disengaged with a lever, acting as a primitive clutch. On July 15, 1896, Foss fired up his creation for the first time on the streets of Sherbrooke. The engine coughed, sputtered, then settled into a steady rhythm. Witnesses described the e sound as like a gatling gun firing slowly. Foss engaged the drive mechanism, and the carriage lurched forward. Canada's first gasoline-powered automobile was officially running. The performance was modest but revolutionary for Canada. Top speed was about 8 miles per hour on level ground, dropping to 4 mph on hills. The engine produced approximately 4 horsepower at 300 rpm. Fuel consumption was atrocious, about 2 miles per gallon of gasoline, which cost 30 cents per gallon when you could find it. Most pharmacies sold gasoline as a cleaning solvent in small bottles. Foss had to special order it by the barrel from Montreal. At the Sherbrooke Fair that September, Foss's automobile was the sensation. Thousands of people came to see the horseless carriage that moved under its own power. Local newspapers called it the marvel of the age and a glimpse into the future. The lieutenant governor of Quebec took a ride and declared it most remarkable. Orders for similar vehicles started pouring in, but Foss wasn't interested. In his mind, the automobile was a novelty, not a practical transportation solution. Roads were terrible, gasoline was hard to obtain, and the machine required constant maintenance. He saw more potential in stationary engines for farm equipment and machine shops. This was his first crucial miscalculation. Through 1897 and 1898, Foss continued to refine his engine designs. He built several more units, each more sophisticated than the last. His second engine featured dual flywheels for smoother operation. His third incorporated a governor to regulate speed automatically. He was granted Canadian patent 58588 for his carburetor design, which was remarkably advanced for its time, featuring adjustable fuel mixture and a float chamber to maintain consistent fuel level. Word of Foss's achievements reached beyond Canada. In 1899, he received a letter from Ransom E. Olds, founder of Oldsmobile, inquiring about his engine designs. Foss responded politely, but showed no interest in collaboration. He was convinced that the future lay in stationary power, not transportation. The technical sophistication of Foss's work becomes apparent when you compare it to contemporary designs. The Durier Motor Wagon of 1896 used a four-horsepower single-cylinder engine nearly identical in displacement to Foss's, but the Durier was built by two brothers with significant financial backing and access to machine shops in Springfield, Massachusetts. 
Foss achieved the same result alone in a bicycle shop with hand tools. His carburetor was particularly advanced. While most early carburetors were simple mixing valves, Foss's design incorporated what we'd now call a Venturi principle, using the vacuum created by airflow to draw fuel into the mixture. The float chamber maintained consistent fuel level regardless of tank position or vehicle angle, solving a problem that plagued many early automobiles on hills. Then came 1902 and the meeting that would define Foss's legacy. Henry Ford, not yet the industrial titan he would become but already making waves in Detroit, traveled to Montreal for a business meeting. He'd heard about Foss's work and made a detour to Sherbrooke. Ford examined Foss's latest engine, took a ride in his automobile, and made an offer, come to Detroit as a partner in his new venture. Ford needed someone with Foss's practical engineering skills and innovative thinking. Foss declined. He told Ford that automobiles were a passing fancy and that the real future was in stationary engines for agricultural use. Ford reportedly laughed and said, Mr. Foss, you're a brilliant engineer, but a terrible prophet. History would prove Ford right, though it would take a few more years for the truth of his words to become apparent. The technical reasons for Foss's skepticism were actually sound for 1902. Roads in Canada were abysmal, mostly dirt tracks that turned to mud in spring and snow-covered obstacles in winter. Gasoline infrastructure didn't exist outside major cities. A horse could eat grass anywhere. A car needed refined petroleum that had to be shipped from refineries. Maintenance was complex and parts were non-existent. When something broke on Foss's car, he had to manufacture the replacement himself. But Foss failed to see what Ford understood. These were solvable problems. Infrastructure follows demand. Roads could be improved. Gas stations could be built. Parts could be mass-produced. Ford saw the automobile not as it was in 1902, but as it could be in 1920. Foss saw only the present. Between 1902 and 1905, Foss continued his engine development, but his focus shifted entirely to stationary applications. He built engines for sawmills, grain elevators, and machine shops. His designs were reliable and efficient, but he was now competing with established manufacturers like Fairbanks Morse, who had proper factories and distribution networks. Foss was still building engines one at a time in his shop. The specifications of his later engines showed continuous improvement. His 1904 model produced 8 horsepower from a 150 cubic inch single cylinder, achieving thermal efficiency around 18% remarkable for the era. He experimented with overhead valves when most engines still used side valves, understanding that better breathing meant more power. He developed an early form of pressure lubrication using an engine-driven pump instead of splash lubrication or manual oilers. Meanwhile, Ford was revolutionizing the automotive industry. The Model A launched in 1903, followed by the Model C, F, K, and N in rapid succession. By 1908, when Ford introduced the Model T, he was producing cars by the thousands. That same year, Foss was still building custom engines in his Sherbrooke shop, convinced he'd made the right choice. The immediate impact of Foss's decision was minimal. His life continued much as it had, running his shop, building the occasional engine, repairing bicycles and farm equipment. But the long-term consequences were staggering. Had Foss partnered with Ford, Canada might have become an early automotive powerhouse. Sherbrooke could have rivaled Detroit. The Canadian economy might have developed differently with a strong domestic automotive industry from the very beginning. Consider the technical knowledge Foss could have brought to Ford. His carburetor design was arguably superior to what Ford was using in 1902. His understanding of cold-weather operation, crucial for Canadian conditions, could have accelerated the development of all-weather automobiles. His innovative approach to problem-solving, demonstrated by creating an entire engine from a magazine article, 
might have pushed Ford's engineering in new directions. The financial implications are mind-boggling. Ford's early partners became millionaires many times over. John and Horace Dodge invested $10,000 in Ford Motor Company in 1903 and received $32 million in dividends over the next 16 years, plus $25 million when Ford bought them out. Foss could have had a similar stake, transforming not just his own fortune, but potentially creating a Canadian automotive dynasty. Looking at this story from today's perspective, it's easy to judge Foss harshly. How could he not see what seems so obvious to us? But Foss was making a rational decision based on the information available to him. In 1902, there were over 100 automobile manufacturers in the United States, and most would fail within a few years. The Stanley Steamer outsold gasoline cars. Electric vehicles were considered superior for city driving. Picking gasoline-powered automobiles as the winner required vision that few possessed. What's remarkable is how close Foss came to greatness without even trying. He wasn't attempting to create a Canadian automotive industry. He wasn't racing to be first. He was simply a curious mechanic solving interesting problems. That he accidentally created Canada's first automobile and caught Henry Ford's attention speaks to his raw talent and innovative thinking. The technical legacy of Foss's work lived on in unexpected ways. His carburetor patents were referenced by later inventors. His approach to adaptation, using bicycle technology for automotive applications, became standard practice in the early automotive industry. Many of the mechanics he trained went on to become automotive pioneers in their own right, spreading his knowledge throughout Quebec and beyond. Modern automotive historians have studied Foss's surviving engines and been impressed by their sophistication. The machining quality rivals anything produced in major American or European factories of the period. The design choices show deep understanding of thermodynamic principles, despite Foss having no formal engineering education. He was, in modern terms, a naturally gifted engineer who happened to be born in the wrong place at the wrong time. In 1927, as Model T production finally ended, after 15 million units, a reporter tracked down Foss, now 54 years old and still running his shop in Sherbrooke. Asked if he regretted his decision to reject Ford's offer, Foss reportedly smiled and said, I built engines. Ford built an industry. We were both doing what we were meant to do. It was a gracious response that avoided the real question. What if they had done it together? George Foote Foss represents something profound about innovation and timing. He had the technical skills to change history, but lacked the vision to see where history was heading. He solved every engineering problem put in front of him, but couldn't solve the bigger question of where technology and society were going. His story reminds us that genius alone isn't enough. You need genius, vision, and the courage to bet everything on a future that doesn't exist yet. The man who built Canada's first car, who impressed Henry Ford himself, who could have been one of the automotive industry's founding fathers, died in 1959 at age 86. He lived long enough to see highways span the continent, to see the automobile transform from novelty to necessity, to see Ford become one of the largest companies in the world. Whether he died with regrets, we'll never know. But his story remains one of the most fascinating what-ifs in automotive history. A reminder that building the future requires not just the ability to solve technical problems, but the vision to see which problems are worth solving. What do you think Foss should have done? Would you have taken Ford's offer or stayed independent like Foss? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into forgotten automotive history, Make sure to subscribe because we're just getting started exploring the amazing stories of engineering's unsung heroes.